Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to lecture number nine on NAT and IP version six. Last time we talked about IP version four, in particular a lot about the addressing and forwarding. Um, so IP is the protocol that routes packets from source to the destination across a network that's very large and complex, right? The internet. Um, the way this works, uh, mechanically speaking, is that every router has a forwarding table that maps between ranges of addresses, in particular outbound links, right? Because every router has a set of links they can choose from to uh, send links in different directions. We'll talk later on, um, starting in the next lecture, about how forwarding tables are determined. Um, but for now, we're just kind of assuming that we have those, we've set those appropriately somehow with some information about what the internet topology is, what the network looks like. Uh, those forwarding tables use, lo use longest prefix ma matching uh, to allow multiple rules to potentially match a address, but then use the most specific one to determine the outbound link. IP version 4 has um, a fragmentation feature, not super important, but basically if uh, every link has an MPU, maximum transmission unit, so the maximum packet size for that link, uh, and if if someone sends a packet that's bigger than a particular link can handle in the path it's trying to transfer over, IP version 4 allows that packet to be broken into pieces and reassembled at the destination. IP version 4, uh, like TCP, has a header. This comes before the TCP header. It's 20 bytes long. Um, and we spent a little time looking at IP subnets. So a subnet is a range of addresses that can, can communicate directly, a range of contiguous addresses. Um, and they're defined usually with CIDR notation, which gives the IP address of the first address in the range, and then a slash number where that number indicates the number of high bits that have to remain constant for every address in that range. So the, the smaller this slash number is, the bigger the range is, because that means that there are more free bits on the right-hand side. And this, the, the bigger this number is, the smaller the subnet is. And the CIDR notation is used for specifying both subnets and for specifying routing rules. In other words, for, for ranges that are um, based on uh, binary sizes. Uh, powers of two size, I should say. Uh, there also is an alternative to uh, the CIDR notation that uses what's called a subnet mask, where you have these IP address things that look like IP addresses, these dotted quad numbers, that start with all ones and end with all zeros. So this is an example of one here. Finally, we talked about uh, configuring a host to use IP, the internet essentially, um, there are four pieces of information a machine needs to communicate on the internet. It needs its own IP address, it needs a subnet mask to determine which machines it can contact directly. For the ones, for the machines that cannot contact directly, those outside its subnet, it needs to send the packet to a gateway and it needs that IP address of that gateway so that it can figure out technically what the MAC address is, but anyway, so it can send the, the messages to the uh, gateway and the gateway can relay those to the final destination and then the fourth thing is it needs to know the IP address of a DNS server so that it can use um, those like user-friendly uh, host names instead of IP addresses to contact websites and whatnot. Um, DHCP dynamic host configuration protocol is a, um, a protocol that uses local broadcasts to allow newly arriving machines to request their IP configuration. In other words, these four things I just mentioned for them for a machine. So a machine can move around to different networks where you know it's going to get a different IP address when it joins a new network because it's, it's a different subnet. It's going to get a new gateway, all that stuff, potentially a new DNS server. All right, so uh, those are some basics of IP. I think the most confusing part of that probably is the definition of a subnet. Um, that might become a little bit more clear when we talk about the link layer in a couple more chapters. Now, IP version 4, we, we saw last time that it uses addresses that are 32-bit numbers. Now, 2 to the 32nd power is 4 billion, approximately. So there are only 4 billion IP version 4 addresses. Now, when the internet, when IP version 4 was first invented in, like, I guess the early 80s, I want to say, or late 70s, one or the other, um, that seemed like enough. But nowadays, it's not enough, right? There are, are more devices that want to use the internet then there are IP version 4 addresses. And to 
To deal with the scarcity, your internet service provider will often give you just one address, even though you have multiple devices in your home that want to connect to the internet. Right? And we said that to use the internet, every device needs uh, its own IP address. So what solution might you come up with for this problem? Now, <laughs> if, you, if you have no idea, if you really don't know, you, you, it'll be hard to think of it, but think, the title of this slide gives you a, a hit, a hint, network address translation. Um, so the key insight here, actually, is that we already have a mechanism with TCP and UDP for the operating system to share one IP address with multiple independent processes. So by process, I mean application. You have multiple applications running on your computer that are creating network connections. Um, and port numbers are used to distinguish between different programs on a single machine. Okay, so that port numbers are already a mechanism that allows one IP address to be shared with many processes. How can we use port numbers to allow multiple machines now to share one IP address? If you can stop and figure that out, that would be a good exercise and I would be impressed. Um, but basically the way it works is you make your entire local network look like one big machine. So uh, that you, 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 you put a device in front of your network, which is called a NAT router, network address translation or network address, address translator is a device. So think of your typical home router that looks like a plastic box with um, antennas for its base station and some ports to plug in local devices. So whether you're connected wirelessly or through one of the wired connections, uh, what happens is this router creates a private network and gives out private addresses to the different uh, local devices like your different laptops, your smartphone, your uh, printer, whatever other devices you have that need an internet connection, you get these private addresses. We'll talk more about what those are. Those are kind of like made up addresses that are not part of the internet. And the router has one public address and that public address has 64,000 different ports it can use just like any computer does on the internet, right? Port numbers are 16-bit uh, numbers. So every connection from the variety of different machines internally on different public or different private IP addresses, those, those ports that are being used are translated into unique ports on the public address. And the router tracks maintains a mapping between public ports and local IP address and local port pairs. Okay. Um, so uh, we have a couple of slides to explain what that really means and give examples to make that more clear. But the general idea I want to want to sh share here is that what NAT is doing is making a, a whole set of machines look looked like one big machine with a lot of processes, a lot of different programs running, instead of a bunch. So if you have two machines and each one is running two uh, network two programs have network connections instead of it, it would, the NAT router would make it look like one machine with four connections instead of two machines each that has two connections okay okay so just from a, a high level what the IP version for internet looks like for consumers is something like this right you have at the top you have the public internet which which spans the world and you have lots of machines connected to it with public IP addresses. All these blue numbers are public IP addresses. And that's really the internet. The public uh, IP addresses make the, the what is truly the internet. This thing could include um, you know, a lot of servers that are uh, hosting websites and things like that in uh, data centers, uh, in cloud computing facilities. And um, one interesting thing that you may not realize is that you actually often will have a single physical machine with a single physical connection, like what I'm showing here, a server, that has multiple public IP addresses because there are multiple virtual machines on that, on that machine that are running different operating systems. Um, so in some cases we have one machine that has multiple public IP addresses, which is an, an example would be a server, uh, but then in other cases we have one public IP address that has multiple machines on it. So we have like one-to-many and many-to-one mappings between IP addresses and machines, uh, depending on where you're looking. Okay, So as part of this internet, let's imagine we have an internet service provider uh, that has a, an edge router, 
So this is the, the gateway that, and this ISP sells service to customers. So it, it builds lines like late wires to connect to homes. And if you're one of those customers, you get this wire right here that goes into your house. And if you plug in a device to this wire, you get a public, you get an IP address from this ISP gateway. In this case, the IP address we're getting is 35.10.3.7. So you are on the public internet, but you only have one address. So what you do is you install your own router, a NAT router, that creates a private network locally. So in this case, we, and we call this a LAN, local area network, instead of the WAN, which is the wide area network. Wide area network refers to the public uh, internet and LAN refers to a private network. So in the private network, we have these other fu funky addresses that are just, they're 10 .0 .0 something. So all these different computers and devices in my house have 10 .0 .0 something addresses. This, uh, these, these IP ad addresses are actually kind of fake addresses in, other, in the sense that they're not part of the um, public internet. They're private addresses. I mean, fake is kind of a weird word, but I should say they're private addresses. Um, when these devices, of course, the reason that they're connected, the main reason they're connecting to the, to the network is not to talk to themselves, although they might, like a computer might send a message to a printer locally on this local network, this red network. For the most part, though, they're trying to connect to the internet to check mail and send messages and, ch and browse the web, right? So these devices need to talk to the public internet. Whenever they do that, whenever they send a message outwards, that message will look to the receiver, like let's say it's going to the server, like it's coming from this one IP address, 35.10.3.7. No matter which one of these machines contacts that website, they will, will all look like the same IP address. Now, remember the way we solved that problem uh, for multiple browser tabs on one machine, for example, was by using different ports for those connections. And we do the same thing with these different machines. So if the first computer is connecting to this to a certain web server, this first one, it might use port, let's say, 10,000 for its connection. Uh, it chooses a port locally. The, the router sees that, and it assigns it it's one of its ports and, and remembers that it, it needs to be translated to uh, that port here. This other machine, when it connects to the same web server, it uses it chooses its own port randomly, you know, so that to avoid conflicts with other processes on that machine. But then the when it gets to the router, the router translates addresses and also chooses a new public port for it. And so, um, yeah, these both look like they're coming from the same public IP address, but with different uh, ports. And again, you know, so there'll be more explanation of that later. Just to make that that clear, what what the this NAT device, this network address translator, uh, is doing. And by the way, I'm in this lecture. I'm going to show I show this image of this home router that's like plastic and probably costs like 50 bucks. It's like a cheap thing. Um, NAT is also used in many um, corporate networks or campus networks. Uh, so it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be one public IP address and a few computers and a cheap little device. It could be a subset of public IP addresses and thousands of users, and the same idea can apply. But the general problem you're solving is you have more users, more devices, than you have public IP addresses. And you need to, to kind of map between the two so that you're sharing public IP addresses with a bunch of users. Right. Okay, so these... NAT devices, these translators, um, will do some manipulation of the packets. Basically, they change the IP address for the um, this private internal device whenever it communicates outside. And the interesting thing about this, one of the interesting things about this is that neither the internal computer, the client, nor the server knows that there's some, a translation happening. The translation that happens is done in such a way that it doesn't require any any um, cooperation of the server or the client. So the client asks for an IP address, it gets a private IP address, and it uses that private IP address. It doesn't necessarily know that what it's gotten is a private IP address, although technically it should, uh, we'll talk about why, but it doesn't need to know, right? It just uses it. So whenever it sends a message, it uses its private IP address. And let's say it's contacting YouTube, so it does a DNS query and if it gets the public IP address for YouTube and it sends a, a, a message to it, an IP packet, right? When that gets to the router, the router ch um, 
changes one piece of it, which is the source address of that message has to be changed to the public address of this router. I mean, the, the port is also changed. We'll talk about that uh, in a second. So that when the message is put out on the network, now you, when YouTube gets it, it, it sees the address of the router, the public address of the router, and it sends its response to that router. When the router gets it, though, it translates back to the private address that was it originally came from the, and um, sends that message back. Okay, So the router has to remember what particular private address was the source of the message that caused this response. Okay. So I've kind of already said this before, but to summarize, we, public IP addresses specify locations on the internet. The internet is sometimes called uh, the Wide Area Network, or WAN. Um, and ser machines that have public IP addresses include front-end servers. Uh, I say front-end because uh, when we talk about servers, these computers that are on all the time and, and in data centers, some of them are actually on private IP addresses because they're not doing things that are public-facing. They might not need public IP addresses, like if you're just doing uh, data analysis of, of data that your company has or something, you don't need to be on the public internet. So, but, but some servers do need to communicate to the outside world, like web servers, or you know servers that are receiving API requests from apps, things like that. So we have front-end servers that have public IP addresses. University campuses tend to have a lot of IP addresses, be, pu public IP addresses, because they uh, join the internet early, like Northwestern has uh, probably a, a class B IP allocation, so they have like, uh, I would guess, 65,000 IP addresses, which is plenty considering how many um, students and staff work at Northwestern. So Northwestern actually has the ability to give public IP addresses to all of its computers, which is unusual, right? Uh, so my computer at work, to, uh, I believe in my office, has a public IP address. Um, when you have an internet connection at home from an internet service provider, usually you get one public IP address, but usually what you do is, theoretically you could just plug one computer into it, and then that computer would have a public IP address, but what most people do is they want to connect multiple computers, so they pl plug in a home, a router, um, which then the router has the public IP address and your internal devices do not. Okay, And also these days, often, I think maybe the default nowadays is not even to, to, to plug in your own router, but your internet service provider might sell you a box that includes a combination of a, a router with a antenna for a base station uh, for, for Wi-Fi, you know, and also um, a cable modem or DSL modem built in to one device. Uh, we'll talk more about the, those modems later. Right, so for these these public IP addresses are unique. So for example, this IP address I'm showing here is the IP address for uh, my web server, for my website, and there's only one machine on the, on the internet that has this IP address. Although we'll see later on that there are ways that that could, that could not be true uh, with IP Anycast, which is a special kind of hack, but that's that's a special case. So for now, let's, let's just say one, every IP address goes to one machine. Um, but that machine could be something like a, a, a NAT router that is behind the scenes sharing its connection. Uh, private IP addresses, on the other hand, are only meaningful on a local network. So if, if, you're, if you have a public private IP address and you somehow give that to someone else, like you tell someone that private IP address and they're in a different location in the world and they try to address a message to that private IP address, it will not get there because uh, that private IP address is not part of the internet per se. It's part of a local area network, a LAN, and these, this includes anything behind a NAT, uh, like a home or office or, or a backend server. In some cases, you could also have a local area network that's not connected to the internet at all, uh, especially in the old days before the internet was, was so popular. Um, then you still would call that a LAN, and you would not need a NAT to translate from public to private IP addresses. You just have a connection of computers that are all private. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of a, a weird case. So it's usually behind a NAT to give hosts access to the internet, but if you don't need to give them access to the, to the internet, you don't need that NAT. And interestingly, all these addresses are in specific IP version 4 ranges because uh, the IP version 4 specification carved out certain special addresses to be used for private networks. And so these this includes uh, 10 dot whatever, 172 dot 16 dot whatever, 
or 192.168.0, or no, sorry, 192.168. whatever. So these are different sizes. There's a slash 8, which is a big one, slash 12, pr pretty big, and slash 16, medium sized. Usually your home routers use 192.168 uh, because slash 16 is, is plenty of addresses. This, you know, this gives you 64,000 addresses you can use. Uh, you certainly don't need more than that when these other ones give you more. So usually, actually, your home ad, your home NAT router will use a slash 24 subnet. So the device, it'll support up to 255 connected devices. And then it will be the this 256th device as the router, as the gateway, I should say. So pr private addresses like 192.168.0.100 are, they're, they're like millions of machines around the world tens of millions, uh, if not hundreds of millions, or it could be even like a billion, <laughs> uh, that have that private IP address. Because if they're all behind uh, NAT routers, uh, and 100 happens to be a common choice for the beginning range of IP addresses that are assigned to devices. Uh, but they all can connect, to, can talk to each other on the internet because uh, when they send messages, to the outside world, those addresses are translated to the public, the one public IP address for that uh, customer. Okay. All right, so here's another way of looking at this, a different diagram that shows kind of the same thing, except for zooming in on this NAT router, this network address translator. And this, this NAT device has two IP addresses. So it has one to connect to the rest of the internet that has a public address out here on the left-hand side. But then on the right-hand side, it has a private address, which it can use to communicate to other devices on that local network. Okay, So you'll notice that all these right-hand side devices on the local network have addresses that start with 10.0.0. Uh, you can keep adding more of them. They can talk to each other with those addresses. But when they want to talk to the outside world, they send a message through the gateway. Um, and that, that gateway, that NAT gateway, translates the source address to be its own address so that the receiver can um, send it back to this interface on the left hand side for it to translate. So when when these internal machines want to send a message to the outside world, um, they can definitely the, the device does the NAT device doesn't need to do anything to allow those those packets to reach their destination because these these private devices will be aware of the public addresses of everyone else on the internet. But in order for those, the receiver to correctly address their response, the um, source address of those outgoing messages needs to be changed. And when those incoming messages come in, they need to be somehow routed to the correct machine inside here. Okay, so this router, this NAT device, this NAT router is going to be getting a lot of, of messages. And it needs to make a decision about which of the several machines inside is the intended a recipient of that message. Okay, so it does this by keeping a port mapping table, and the action that it, that this NAT router does is um, is outlined here. And I think maybe it's it's best to see it in the, the illustration I have in the next slide. But um, just to quickly go over this, outgoing messages, outgoing uh, packets or datagrams have the source IP address and port replaced with the, so the public IP address of the NAT device and some new port number that the uh, NAT device uh, decides. Um, of course, it, it's, it's new if it's a new connection, but for a given TCP connection, let's say, the same port number will be used. The remote host will respond uh, to this address that the NAT device gave and if the NAT router remembers this translation it made from the private source and port to the public address and uh, port, it'll it can translate back on incoming messages. Okay, so that was a lot of words, but I think looking at an example will make this clear. Uh, so let's go this through this slowly. So we have this three different machines on a private network connected to a NAT. So this this NAT router has a translation table which maps between WAN addresses and LAN addresses, so public addresses and private addresses. Okay. The 
this, so this top machine on the, on the top right sends a message, right? It, it, what this di diagram, this uh, figure um, is going to show what the source and destination IP addresses and ports are. So it has chosen randomly port number 3345 as the source of this message. And this number is to remember is to distinguish it from all the different other different networking programs that might be running on that computer, right? So this is what this, the OS knows that this 3345 corresponds to a particular, let's say, browser tab or, or other process that's running on that machine. Okay. It's chosen the destination 128.119.40.186. That address came probably from a DNS lookup. Like, let's say it was going to northwestern.edu, and it did a query to figure out what the IP address was from northwestern.edu. Um, if, if this is a web request, then the public, the port number it should use is port 80 by default for unencrypted HTTP. Okay, so the construction of this message should be fairly straightforward so far. There's nothing new so far about why the um, initiator here, this, pu this private machine, has constructed this message like so. Okay, but notice that the source address it chose is going to have to change because this is a private address. But it goes ahead and sends this. Now, where does it send it? It sends it to the gateway because the destination, it can tell, is outside of its subnet. It knows that its own subnet is 10.0.0.0 slash .0 .0 24. So, so um, this destination is not one of its near neighbors inside its subnet. So it needs to send it to the router, to the gateway, um, which is the particular router that's closest to it and the gateway will forward it to its final destination as indeed it does but this particular gateway does more than just that because it needs to do some translation okay so in step two the gateway this nat device this router gets the message and it needs to do, to do more than just examine the destination to figure out where to forward it it needs to it needs to translate from private to public ip addresses so what it does um if this is the first time that it's, we're assuming this is the first time that this source has sent a message from this port number recently. Okay. The NAT device will need to assign a public port number to this connection. So it chooses one randomly, one that's not being used. In this case, the one it, cho it chose is the port it chose is 5001. Okay, so it's it says it, it tells itself, okay, I'm gonna use port 5001 for this connection. And by this connection, I mean for any messages that come from 10.0.0.1, port number 3345. Now, it, there could be other uh, connections from that same machine that have a different port number. Those would get a different uh, public port number. Okay. The, pu the public IP address, of course, is going to be the one only one public IP address that I have available in this case. Although, as I said before, if we had, if this was a big corporate network, maybe there would be multiple public IP addresses to choose from. But for now, we're assuming the simple case where we have one of these, it's, it's one of these home um, plasticky uh, <laughs> routers that just has one public IP address. Okay, so I've chosen that translation. I've stored it in my translation table because I'll need this later. And then I, I, I changed the message that came in. I changed the message by altering the source IP address and port. So where previously it said t source was 10.0.0.1 .0 .0 port 3345, I make it this new port that I've uh, chosen, <coughs> excuse me, and put my public IP address on it. By doing that, of course, now I've created a packet that makes sense to the outside world. So when the receiver gets it, it will, it doesn't know that, 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 that there, there was any translation that happens. It will just re respond in the normal way by sending a message that's from itself, right? It's from um, 128.119.40.186 port 80. And the destination is just the whatever the source that was on that packet. Now this source is not actually the, this is not, somehow not the true source. This is a translated source, which identifies a port on this NAT device. So this, this destination of the response, this is not the final destination, that, but it is a, it's the public destination for this response, which is on this router. Okay, so the router gets the response uh, in step number three. It gets the response, and what it can do is translate it. It checks its table and says, "Okay, I got a, I got a message uh, 
on my port 5001, what do I do with this? Who do I give it to, in other words? To, to make that decision, all it has to do is look at the translation table and find port 5000 and says, okay, I have a mapping for port 5001, and it is uh, IP address 10.0.0.1, port number 3345. So let me change that destination and relay the message on the local network, right? So we do that, and the message gets back to the client, okay? That's pretty simple. This can happen simultaneously on multiple uh, machines. Now notice, if this is a TCP connection, there are probably many packets going back and forth. So this, let's say there's a, there probably is going to be another packet that comes back from, that goes out from the private machine, from the, 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 the client, let's say, uh, like an acknowledgement maybe. So when that message is sent, it'll come again from port 3345, because it's the same TCP connection. The source will, of course, again be 10.0.0.1. But this time, when the router gets it, it will see in its table that it already has a record. So it'll use the, it'll look, do a look, look up on the right-hand side of this table. It'll see that there's already a record, so it won't generate a new public port. It'll use the existing public port. And so we can have multiple... Um, packets go back and forth using the same translation for the duration of the uh, TCP connection. But eventually over time, actually, the, there, there's a timeout for these. So let's say after, I don't know what the timeout would be, it depends, but like maybe 60 seconds or 5 minutes or 10 minutes, this uh, router will forget a translation if there were not any recent pack so there's also another column that probably has the time of the most recent message that came through on this uh, mapping and if it if that if that times out like in other words if there aren't any packets for a while the router will forget this translation because it wants to free up this public port so it can be reused by another um, private device and that's the reason why I talked early on uh, that TCP can send to keep alive messages. That's one of the reasons to keep this uh, translation alive in a NAT. Okay. So uh, that was a lot. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, uh, you can review that little uh, demonstration. I think that the demo uh, makes it pretty clear uh, if you go through it slowly enough. So there's some problems in introduced by NAT. Um, at first, it seems like, I mean, it, it's certainly helpful that we're able to overcome this limitation of the number of IP addresses, but there's some problems introduced. So notice that um, the local clients can, can, can only be reached by public IP addresses if they themselves recently contacted that public IP address. So the mapping, the mapping I showed in this, in this previous slide, in order to create this, they, there's a, a packet from the inside has to be sent first to initiate, to create one of these mappings. If these internal machines are quiet and they don't do anything and someone from the outside wants to talk to one of them, the router, they, there's no way they can send a message that will accomplish that because the router will get a message. It won't know who it, it, it's destined for because the originator has no way to specify which of these different machines it should, it should talk to. Uh, the only... The sort of hack that gets around that is some of these these routers allow you to, to have a permanent port mappings, so uh, you can reserve certain ports if you want to um, allow your a particular internal machine to receive unsolicited messages. You can configure a router to permanently map a certain port, and then the outside machine would have to know to send messages to that port. Um, yeah, so that's what was, the second bullet point is what I just mentioned: a permanent port forwarding uh, for unsolicited packets. Another problem here is that it works just at the by changing the IP headers. There are some protocols, um, one in particular called SIP, which is a session initiation protocol that's used for voice over IP telephony, for uh, voice over IP phones. Um, if a protocol like SIP advertises the IP address in the payload of a message, it won't be translated by the NAT. So like if you look at your machine IP address and you like tell someone hey like if you like literally like write a, ch a chat message or say on the telephone hey my IP address is 10.0.0.3 the receiver will get that the NAT won't translate it because the message you just conveyed is not part of an IP header that it sees it's it's, in, it's translated it's transmitted in some other way um, the receiver will get that and say okay great I'll let me send you a message to 10.0.0.3 and of course that won't work 
SIP does something like that. It sends it the uh, voice over IP phone will um, send in this session description protocol, which is like where it, it tells the the other side where to send its audio messages. It, it that message includes an IP address, and that IP address will be wrong if it's a, a private IP address. So some protocols don't work well with NAT. Um, although these days NAT is so popular that it would be most people would see that. It would see a protocol like SIP that uses uh, IP, advertises IP addresses directly as being flawed because it's not compatible with the modern IP version for uh, internet. Another problem is that temporarily inactive TCP connections could be forgotten and messages could be dropped. So that's this is what I just mentioned earlier about TCP connections needing to send keep alive packets so the NAT router doesn't forget the port mapping. It needs to eventually. It does need to eventually forget to make room for later connections because the number of ports on that NAT device are limited to um, sixty-four thousand, um, which is, seems like a lot. It is a lot, but if you consider a machine, several machines that have multiple connections, multiple tabs, um, over time they would keep accumulating more and more ports until sixty-four thousand would be used up pretty quickly if there were, like w were not uh, some mechanism to re reuse them. So a, a corollary to that, or to go into more detail about the first problem, peer-to-peer uh, -peer systems are very difficult to design when you have NATs. Because a peer-to-peer -peer system requires computers to listen for requests from the other computers in the network. And like I said, if a machine has a private IP address, it can't really listen for unsolicited messages it needs to make a request first itself so the NAT router creates a mapping to accept responses. Okay, Skype originally uh, was designed as a peer-to-peer -peer voice communication system and uh, the reason it was designed that way uh, was to allow the system to scale without having a high cost of um, servers to like relay messages in between. So you could just write the software, hand it out, and, every, and everyone can kind of talk to each other um, on their own, which is a, a cool design. So the Skype, Skype actually was really another quite innovative application for its architecture when it was first released in the early 2000s, I want to say, or like whenever that was, around 2005, I, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, but it doesn't work well with NAT, okay? because uh, these machines won't be able to talk to each other. Now, so, so to illustrate that, if this if this machine here tries to, even if this machine knows the public IP address for this other Skype cus caller it's trying to reach, if somehow, even if these devices could figure out what their public IP addresses were and they tried to use them, when this first machine tries to call the second one, the NAT router, the message will get to the NAT router, but it will drop it because the NAT router has no record that this particular machine is listening for something from this other machine, right? The way that we create those records, remember, is you send the, the client sends a request, and and with a public IP address as a destination and a private IP address as a source, and the NAT router records, uh, you know, assigns a new public port for that connection and assigns it to its records it in its table. So, I want you to stop and think about ways to fix this problem to allow two machines. So the problem is to be clear. Two machines on, that are on private networks that want to communicate to each other for Skype, let's say. How would you solve that problem? The problem is that they can't they can't initiate a conversation because neither neither of the two NAT routers is willing to accept unsolicited, in other words, new messages from from new IP addresses. All right, so the solution to this basically is to use a relay. So you have to, you have to, you do have to introduce some kind of public IP address into the mix, um, which makes this less a, a less truly peer-to-peer -peer service. But we try to do as as little work in the relay as possible to have as little cost for this relaying. Okay, so we have this machine on the cloud that has a public IP address that will accept messages and just hand them off to the other receiver. So a message, when this left right-hand side party wants to send a message, they actually send it 
not to the final destination, but to, to the relay, which has a public IP address. The NAT router will, of course, allow that because it allows outbound messages and it'll, it'll record a, a record. It'll create a record in its table to allow the response to come through. Um, so one more time. The other party also has to make a connection to a relay in order for this to work. All right, so maybe they both have signed into the service and by signing in, they connect to a relay. Once they do that, of course, they can send messages to each other through the relay. And these, both of these NAT routers are now configured to allow packets that come from the relay. They, I mean, they're not, at this point, they're, they're not, they wouldn't allow packets that came directly from the other party. But if that party is relaying their messages through this uh, relay that they each have contacted first, uh, then that can work. Okay, so the conversation occurs through the relay. Now, I want you to stop and think about this quickly. This is more of a software architecture problem, but it's kind of interesting. Do both of these clients have to connect to the very same relay, the same public IP address, in order for this conversation to work? So think about that. The answer, I think, is that it would be convenient if they did because the relay could just hand off the packets directly, but it's not necessary. It's not necessary as long as the different relays have a database that allows them to find the appropriate relay for the, for the receiver. So that a message could come into one relay, that relay sends it to another relay, and that relay hands it off to the other party. And that's probably how these relays systems work in most cases. In order for the relay to find the appropriate other relay, there has to be a database that's shared among the relays that says uh, on which relay is each user connected. Right. Okay, so we talked about NAT for mainly sharing scarce IP version 4 addresses. So there are not a lot of IP version 4 addresses. There are some other benefits to NAT that we see it, where we see it used sometimes. Uh, one of them is security. We just were talking about how local devices are not pub publicly reachable by strangers. By strangers here, I mean, excuse me, machines that you have not first contacted. And that, that has some security benefits, right? So if your machine happens to have vulnerabilities where a certain type of request sequence can cause uh, a, an outside person to gain access, then it would be better to just prevent people from app contacting your machine in the first place unless you are in fact have sent the first message to indicate that you want that connection, right? Um, of course you want to design your system not to have those vulnerabilities, but they still, it, computers are so complex that uh, you, it's, it's difficult to guarantee that there's no vulnerabilities. So there, so this kind of like firewalling does have some benefit in practice. Uh, another benefit for NATs is configuration isolation at the network level in the sense that uh, if you're behind a NAT, your ISP can change your public IP address without your local devices having to change their private IP addresses. There might be some benefit to that. It's kind of a minor thing. Another uh, more significant benefit of NATs is that it they can be used for load balancing. Uh, we talked earlier on about uh, using DNS for load balancing, where we have different IP addresses that are given, given out to different customers. In this case, with NAT, we can have one IP address that is, sh that is shared by several servers that have private IP addresses that are doing work. So we can make one IP address look like a big cluster. Uh, we could put one IP address in front of a big cluster of machines that can do a lot of work. Um, I, I have an asterisk here because these load balancers have a different set of rules for working than, than the home uh, translators I just saw because uh, these are designed to accept inbound requests which is different, right? So the, the new entries in the translation table are created when there's a new inbound request instead of a new outbound request. So there, the, the servers in this cluster would not start new connections on their own, but they but there might be a new request that comes in and the NAT has to basically randomly choose, or randomly or somehow with, with good logic, choose uh, one of the several machines to handle that connection. As long as, they, but in this case, they're all equivalent so that, that can be done uh, pretty easily. All right, so to show an illustration of how NAT can be used for load balancing, and just like any other load balancing balancer, the purpose of this is to provide scaling and fault tolerance, or, or at least scaling, usually, usually both, but it could be just one or the other. We have many clients that are connecting to one IP address. That, that IP address is like one machine that's implementing a load balancer, 
with network address translation. And when requests come in, when a new request comes in, it creates a mapping. It chooses one of the, the several servers in the cluster. All these servers are equivalent, so any one of them could accept the connection. They all have private IP addresses, and they're all listening on a certain port. Probably, this, um, well, it doesn't have to be, but in this case, I'm showing the same port, port 80, which is the standard web server port for HTTP. And yeah, the load balancer will, will say client one, so 4.4.4.4 port 12, 1230, that will be mapped to a connection from me on the private network with port 1002, and that goes to this machine. So this machine will handle that connection, and, and many packets can flow back and forth there. And another client, if it's a different client, it'll get a different mapping to a different private uh, port number. And it might choose a different server. You know, of course, you can have multiple. Uh, you'll have, in general, multiple connections to any one of the servers. So it's still not network address translation. It's happening in reverse. The public and private roles are, are reversed, and we have many interchangeable servers that can accept uh, the request. And this load balancer, because it's close to these servers, it can do a little bit more than a, a DNS-based load balancer. It can monitor the health and load of servers and make choices at very short uh, reaction times about whether or not a server should be used. So for example, if server B crashes, the load balancer will can notice it very quickly because it'll stop seeing traffic from it or it might periodically send like health checks. And once it notices, like within seconds, the load balancer can stop sending new, new connections to this particular server. That's very different than the DNS-based load balancer because DNS is a globally distributed system with caching, so DNS can take minutes uh, to adapt to uh, new configurations. So if you want to stop a server from getting uh, requests through DNS, it'll take several minutes for that to happen. So DNS is not a good way to implement fault tolerance uh, in, a, in a load balancer, whereas this NAT-based load balancer does that really well. This is sometimes called a layer 4 load balancer. Layer 4 in the traditional description of networking refers to TCP and UDP. Um, that's why it's called the layer 4 load balancer, because it's basically what it's doing is it's, it's manipulating the ports, which is a TCP and UDP function. And so one thing to keep in mind here, you may wonder how is it that we can have one, what benefit does it provide to have one machine in front of many servers? It seems like this would be a bottleneck anyway. Like, uh, why, why, how does this provide more scaling? If, if everyone has to talk to this one load balancer, how does that provide more capacity than just having them directly talk to one server? Well, in some cases it might not, but if if, if it so happens that the work you that the ser a server has to do to respond to a request is significant, like there's a lot of code that needs to run, there's a database that needs to be checked, there's a lot of, of disk access or network activity, which we call I.O., that needs to happen to give a response. So if the requests require a lot of work, then, 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 it, then you know, the number of requests per second this server can handle might be 100, but the load balancer is doing very little work per connection. It's just translating port numbers. So if that that port translation work might only take one tenth, one one hundredth, or one one thousandth of the time that it takes the server to actually handle the the full request with all the work that needs to happen there. So that, that's why the it, this, this that wouldn't necessarily be a bottleneck because there's very little work happening at the load balancer. Cool. Uh, just to, as a little preview of the scalable software architectures class that I teach. Uh, CS310, this covers load balancers in more detail, but um, load balancers are a topic that kind of span networking and uh, architecture. So, so I want to mention a little bit about that here to see how this fits into the bigger picture. So we just saw NAT-based load balancers, and we've seen DNS-based load balancers. Um, the NAT-based load balancers forward individual packets and map ports, so there's very little work there. There's another kind of load balancer that we kind of saw with content delivery networks, which were the reverse proxies. Uh, this is like a what's called, sometimes called a layer five um, layer five proxy because it works at the HTTP layer. So this you have a load balancer that actually accepts a full HTTP request and constructs a totally new HTTP request that's based on that first one. Uh, 
so that you have many packets coming in before you send many packets out. But the benefit of that is that it allows caching to happen if necessary, and content delivery networks use that. Together with DNS-based load balancer de balancing that content delivery networks use in that geographic way to direct users to the closest uh, reverse proxy. And finally, there's another kind of yet another kind of load balancing called IP Anycast. This is where we have one IP address that's assigned to multiple machines around the world. And uh, BGP, which is the uh, we'll talk about in the next chapter, has a how is what determines the path that packets uh, take. Um, we basically have different paths that you can take to reach that IP address depending on where you are, and those paths will lead to different machines. Uh, so that's kind of a hack in a way, but that lets you have one IP address that's that reaches many machines around the world. All right, so we'll talk more about load balance. We would talk more about load balancers in the 310 class. So if you're interested in that, uh, consider taking that. So NATs, network address translators, are actually part of a general category of network devices called middle boxes. Middle boxes are network devices, also sometimes called appliances, network appliances, that transform, filter, or inspect packets, but are not routers. In other words, they're not just forwarding. So routers were, were a core concept in the internet. Middle boxes came around later on as people, or as different kinds of hacks, basically, to provide additional functionality on uh, a network. So we saw, we've saw we seen NATs. So what do they do besides just forwarding? Well, they, they transform ports, right? Load balancers, another example of a middle box, which could be a NAT. Uh, firewalls are another kind of middle box, right? The purpose of a firewall is not just to forward, but also to drop traffic if it matches certain simple rules, usually based on the source port, uh, destination port, source port, source IP address, destination IP address. Um, this can be used to block certain um, malicious IP addresses. It also can be used for censoring. Um, there are also, and it's not, often firewalls are combined with NATs, so your home uh, router might have uh, some simple firewall rules built in. An extension of that is deep packet inspection firewalls, which look for application-specific behaviors. So they look for more than just IP addresses and port numbers to decide whether to drop packets. So for example, um, WordPress, which is a common software for running web pages, uh, as you might know, there, the admin page for WordPress is always a, a, a URL that's WP slash admin, right? So uh, a, a lot of attackers will try to guess your WordPress password to break into your website, right? Like, you know that people tend to choose bad passwords or very often choose bad passwords. So there's a lot of bots that are just like trying to, just contacting every machine on the internet and hoping that you're that it's a WordPress server and hoping you have a bad password, right? So trying to log in with a bad password. And, and you can notice that with a deep packet inspection firewall, by uh, looking for HTTP GET requests to the slash WP dash admin URL. So if you look at that HTTP header, you can, that's called a deep packet inspection. Um, you can do that to block the, those attacks, right? And deep packet inspection also can be used uh, for censorship uh, types of firewalls. For example, like if it's not, like the IP address firewall would be like if you want to block Facebook in your country, let's say, you can do that based on IP addresses. On the other hand, if you want to do something more subtle, like if you want to block Google searches for certain words, you can do that with a deep packet inspection firewall, right? You, you would allow that the IP address is okay that you're contacting. It's okay you're contacting Google, but we but you can the deep packet inspection firewall can look at the search terms to block it. Now, of course, this doesn't work well if you're using encryption, which we'll talk about later in the class. Another variation of this kind of ex extending firewalls and deep packet inspection firewalls is an intrusion detection system. Um, this works on even more complex types of attacks that involve multiple steps. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily just drop, look at a packet and decide whether to make a decision, but it, it gathers uh, traffic information over a, a time window and does an analysis to detect multiple step attacks. And then, and then uh, perhaps implement a firewall rule that, that's based on, on the finding of the intrusion detection system. Okay, so quick intermission here. If you need a, a breather or you want to take a break, this would be a good time because we're going to move to a different topic.
The new topic is IP version 6, which is related because um, we saw with IP version 4 that we had an, an address shortage, and NAT was a simple solution for that. I want, well, not a simple solution, a clever solution that is has some side effects. Um, but a better solution to that is IP version 6, in a sense, because it just introduces longer addresses so we can have more addresses, right? So it has 128-bit addresses instead of 32. Um, so they were like, 32 wasn't enough. Like, they didn't just go to 64. They went all the way, 128, right? They're like, we don't ever want to have this problem of running out of IP addresses again. Um, side question, was there an IP version 5? Probably. I don't know. I've never heard of it. Um, that might have been an experimental proposal. But IP version 6 was uh, invented in the early 90s when this shortage was foreseen. Remember, early 90s was before the internet really was popular among consumers, but people could see that it was going to be and the shortage was, was, was going to happen. But now, uh, 27 years later, IP version 6 is becoming more popular. It's being adopted, but slowly. So it still has not taken on. IP version 6, version 4 is still the standard, and NAT is still used extensively. That's why I spent so much time talking about it. Um, and we'll, we'll see by the end of the chapter I th of this lecture, I think, why it's been so slow. Uh, but this is a common frustration, I think, for, for network uh, architects or researchers. But it, it, it yeah. So uh, Google actually has a very helpful uh, presentation or website that plots the percentage of its customers of the traffic that Google gets that are IP version 6 enabled. So currently, so as of October 5th, a couple days ago, uh, Google gets 30% uh, of its traffic roughly, or you know, maybe uh, up to 33, 32, 33% of its traffic is IP version 6. But that means that the that the majority, the two-thirds majority right now is still IP version 4. And this is this plot goes from 2010 to 2020, so it's like slowly going up. It's not it's not going up sharply, but it's, it is going up. Um, and that's been happening steadily. You can see if you go, if you were to go back to 2013 or something, IP version 6 would be uh, very uncommon. But nowadays it is gaining popularity. But it, it, it's, it's hard for it to gain popularity. We'll see why. But before we do that, let's talk about what it is and why it's great, uh, why it's better, I guess. Um, first of all, let's look at the addresses. Now, one of the downsides, I guess, of, the, of having long addresses is that you have to write and write long addresses, right? Uh, these are four times as long as IP version 4. Uh, they use hexadecimal notation instead of dotted quad decimal, and that's actually better in my opinion. At least if you understand hex, it's it's better, and it's not that hard to understand hex uh, because you can you can very directly translate from individual uh, characters, uh, you know, hex hex numbers to groups of four bits if you wanted to. Instead of having dots in between the chunks, we do have we break this into what is this uh, eight different chunks each. So 8 times 8, no, 8 times 4 is 128, nope, that's not right, 8 times 4 times 4 is 128, 4 times 4 is 16, yeah, so each of these four character um, segments is a, represents 16 bits, and you have 8 of them, so 8 times 16 is 128, great. Uh, when you're, so there's a full the full-blown representation is like that you see on the left-hand side here. These are three example addresses. But if, whenever you have zeros, um, if you have a bunch of zeros together, any number of these groups of zeros can be replaced by colon colon. And then for any any four uh, any one of these groups, if it has leading zeros, the leading zeros can be left off. So this first one, which is the uh, local host address. Um, equivalent to 127.0.0.1 in IP version 4. Um, this address can be represented with just colon colon 1. The second one has a bunch of significant figures up front and then some zeros at the end, so it can be represented with a trailing uh, semicolon semicolon. And the final one here has uh, just some zeros in the middle, and that can be represented with the colon colon uh, substitution in the middle. <clears throat> 
Okay. So, uh, of course, you can only have one of these substitutions because if you had more than one, then it would be ambiguous how many zeros went in, e went in each one. Okay. But yeah, this is how uh, you can represent IP version for addresses and, and write them down. Uh, so notice I have the last one shows how you, you can use hex characters. Um, in general, you'll see hex characters, not just the uh, binary, uh, not just the decimal uh, digits. Um, um, okay, so if we compare that to IP version 4, this is what we saw with IP version 4. Notice that, that we had 32-bit addresses for the source and destination in version 4. That's going to have to change, right? So what we do with version 6 is we make those source and destination addresses four times as long, so 128 bits instead. We also dropped the uh, fragmentation fields, so that what I showed in yellow before, that wasn't that's not really necessary anymore, so we dropped that. Um, it's not, it was not a very important feature in IP version 4 because we have TCP to deal with uh, breaking things into smaller pieces. Uh, some of these fields in here are basically the same as, as something equivalent in IP version 4, like this priority header is the same, kind of the same as the type of service header in IP version 4. This is if you have routers that want to label packets with different numbers so they can be treated with different levels of priority. Uh, excuse me. The flow label can be used perhaps to identify a different to distinguish different TCP connections, but that's ambiguous because you already have ports to do that. Um, hop limit is the same as TTL. But because these addresses, so we, we did remove one, um, we removed four bytes of, of header stuff for fragmentation, but we added a lot more for the addresses. So in total, we end up with 40 bytes of IP version 6 header overhead instead of 20 bytes for IP version 4. So, the, so we added an additional 20 bytes to every packet if, you, if you're assuming TCP. So we have 60 bytes of app uh, of header overhead plus the application layer overhead. Every packet gets 20 bytes bigger, basically, because the addresses are bigger. And that's one of the downsides of IP version 6. So things that were dropped, the checksum field was dropped, not necessarily to save space, but to save work. Um, because checksums are already implemented in TCP and UDP layers below Ethernet and, and also in Ethernet above or below depending on how you're looking at it. The, 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 the IP checksum was kind of redundant and unnecessary so that was removed. Uh, and because the TTL is changed each time a packet moves, remember TTL is like the, the number of hops that a packet is allowed to live for to prevent infinite loops. So when you're decrementing that every time it goes through a router, that changes the IP header, and then that IP checksum needs to change. So redoing, uh, so redoing that every time was uh, was putting unnecessary load on routers. Fragmentation support was dropped, like I said, uh, to keep routers simple and fast, and to because we have TCP to deal with um, chunking of big data. But the big downside of IP version 4 is that you have this additional 20 bytes of header overhead that came from uh, making the addresses a lot longer. And, you know, you're getting additional overhead in terms of the size. That's significant. Like every single packet is bigger by 20 bytes, which is percentage wise, that's like at, at least, uh, that's at least 1%. 1.5% of your packet size, but for small packets, it could be a lot more. Like for small packets, it might be 10% or even 20% of your packet size that is growing. That it, so that's that's kind of a tough pill to swallow. That's it, it's it's a big disadvantage of of, TC, of IP version six, especially if you already have plenty of addresses, or you have enough addresses combined with NAT to get your uh, work done, to, to yeah to operate on the network. So. So, so that's those are the pros and cons of IP version six. Now, they're not actually directly compatible because they use different addresses, different size addresses. Um, and theoretically, they could have maybe decided that that the all the old IP version four addresses were going to be compatible with IP version six. But the problem is, in order for that to work, you would need everyone running an IP version four router to agree to start. Um, using IP version 6 to be interoperable. The internet is way too large and important and disorganized to force everyone to upgrade to simultaneously support IP version 6. 
So these are not the kind of interoperability that was designed for IP version six and four was not direct backward compatibility, but a kind of um, but tunneling, uh, which 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 we'll talk about in a couple slides here. So we so currently we have a mix of IP version four and IP version six and dual stack routers with, that support both. So you can't necessarily send an IP version six packet across the whole internet, even if your receiver is IP version six compatible. Tunneling allows you to fit one type of packet inside of another to get it part way across the network. Okay, so we put one protocol inside the payload of another. This example shows in blue we have an IP version 6 packet. So at the beginning we have the headers that include like you know the address the source and destination address up here. And then maybe some TCP or UDP payload afterwards. Excuse me. If we want to get that across the internet, we might need to travel through some routers that only support IP version 4. To do that, if you can somehow take that pa that packet that you've constructed in IP version 6 is not going to be readable by those IP version 4 routers, right? They just don't support it. They they haven't upgraded. So what, but they do understand IP version 4. So what you do is you create an IP version 4 packet that has IP version 4 source and destination addresses and then in the payload instead of having a TCP or UDP packet directly, you have this IP version 6 packet that eventually will be unwrapped and delivered. Okay, and this, this kind of tunneling can work in both directions. You can have version 4 inside IP, inside version 6 or version 6 inside version 4. Okay. All right, so this, I like this diagram uh, that I put together to, to try to explain this. Um, so let's, 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 let's talk about this. Originally, we have, we have the, this gray circle oval shows the IP version 4 internet. So this is the big internet that everyone has grown to love, that, that has, has grown huge. And but has limited addresses, right? Now, IP version four was invented. It's not backward compatible with IP version. Ver IP version six was invented. It's not backward compatible with version four. But some people, some operators, decide that it's worth that it provides benefits to themselves, like it allows them to have more addresses. So they decide to adopt it. And so some routers decide to start using IP version six. Now, uh, in order to, they have a choice to either use just IP version six or to use both IP version six and version four. So the, the, the yellow circles inside of the gray are routers that support both version six and version four. So they have both IP addresses, both the short version four addresses and the long version six addresses. And depending on who they're communicating with, they can use one or the other. Now, for the IP version 6 internet to be useful, you want to be able to communicate with every IP version 6 host in the world. Now, if they were all physically connected, that would be easy. But in practice, you're going to have people in different parts of the world that start to adopt IP version 6 that don't have direct connections to other IP version 6 uh, operators. So let's show we have two different islands shown here of IP version 6 adoption. Within the, the within each island, it should be pretty clear that it's easy to communicate with IP version 6. So if this router wants to talk to this router, it has the version 6 IP address for it. It can just use that to communicate with it. But if you want to talk to everyone on IP version 6 internet, uh, like if these these people on the left want to advertise their IP addresses through DNS to everyone and ha be reachable, they need some solution. So the solution for that is is called tunneling. Is tun the, the tunneling I showed in the last slide is used here. And, and the way that happens is through routers that are tunnel endpoints. So these green routers, if these green routers um, strike a deal, if they learn about each other and decide that they're going to agree to forward traffic between themselves to connect to the IP version 6 internet, they can use the tunneling I talked about to do that. So basically what happens is this green router on the left, it can tell this leftmost router that it has a route to the rest of the IP version 6 internet, a certain range of IP version 6 addresses. And when it accepts the, that traffic from this left router, it can't, it can't send it directly, but it can tunnel it 
you can it can wrap it up in an IP version 4 packet that is destined for this other green router that has agreed to unwrap and deliver it, that IP version 6 message. Okay? So these green routers are tunnel endpoints that have agreed to wrap up, transmit, and unwrap uh, IP version 6 traffic that is wrapped inside of IP version 4 packets. Okay? And these routers in the middle that are just IP version 4, there is no need for them to cooperate. They can be as stubborn as they want to about refusing to adopt IP version 6. As long and as what the, these green routers get around it by sending IP version 4 packets to each other, um, and by having because they are on the IP version 4 internet, they can do that. You know, they have IP version 4 addresses. The ones that don't, the, like this one on the lower right, doesn't. It's just IP version 6. Okay. So in this diagram, we have to, to review that we have some routers that are stubborn and only have IP version 4 addresses. They cannot receive IP version 6 packets. They can send just version 4. We have some that are, that are doing both. We call those dual stack uh, hosts. And those are the ones in these uh, subregions inside of IP version 4. And then we have some on the outside that have no IP version 4 address. If, if these only have IP version 6 addresses, then they can communicate. If they have a connection to, to other IP version 6 machines, they can communicate on IP version 6. And you know this one can even communicate to this left hand side IP version 6 island through this tunnel but it cannot contact any of these IP version 4 hosts because it doesn't have an IP version 4 address okay so this is this would be unusual this might only be done for um, special kinds of services that are that are used internally that don't need to contact the whole internet and um, like I said before this this tunnel provides access for this island to the other island and in general there will be multiple tunnels for the to connect the various islands of IP version 6 on the internet as these islands get bigger there become there less there's less need for tunnels and the kind of inefficiency of wrapping up and unwrapping these packets goes away and I, so this is a this design allows IP version 6 to eventually become dominant and to take over and hopefully at some point we can drop IP version 4 support. But this is a really long-term project. It's already been 27 years. It's starting to get to be 30% adoption. The problem is even if you get to 90%, 95% adoption, that's not necessarily going to be enough to turn off the IP version 4 internet. Um, so this is a very slow process and um, pretty interesting, um, both technologically and uh, politically in a sense. Uh, all right, to show tunneling for, in more detail, uh, or in a different way, I guess, let's look at some IP version 6 machines communicating. Logically speaking, it looks like there are four routers on the network that are communicating with IP version 6. But physically, uh, the, the tunnel devices, which are B and E, are getting things done by sending IP version 4, sending messages on this old IP version 4 internet through some uh, paths that they have uh, to connect each other. So these B and E are not connected physically on IP version 6, but they're connected physically with IP version 4. They tunnel messages through IP version 6 messages through IP version 4, um, like, sh like shown here in the middle of the uh, path. Okay, But routers A and F don't need to have any cooperation or knowledge that this tunneling is happening. Uh, when B and, C and E strike this deal, when they agree to tunnel to each other, after that, they'll they'll start advertising to their neighbors that they have access to to the um, that the island on the other side. Advertisements we'll, we'll learn about in in the next um, section, next couple lectures when we talk about BGP. That'll make a little more sense later. Uh, that that's how the uh, how the paths are determined in the first place. Okay, so tunneling works, but it, it also in addition to the we already saw that there were some like size overheads for IP version 6 in terms of the headers getting bigger. When you're additionally tunneling, you're adding even more headers, so the overhead becomes even greater. Um, so tunneling is not great, but it's a solution. It's kind of a hack that makes it work, and it provides a path toward um, IP version 6 adoption at a broader scale. There's more processing that has to happen at these tunnel endpoints, and there's more um, overhead through the tunnel when the data is sent. All right, so you might wonder how do IP version 6 hosts talk to IP version 4 hosts? Well, they don't. 
actually. Like these are two different internets in some sense. Like uh, IP version six is not backward compatible with version four. We said that. Uh, the true IP version four internet is is physically a bunch of islands, but we have tunneling that joins them. Okay, that's we've talked about that already. I kind of alluded to dual stack operation. Dual stack hosts are configured for both IP version four and version six. They have two addresses. These they're two different styles of addresses. Um, we we already mentioned DHCP as a way to get an IP version four address. There's also a DHCP version six request you can make if you want to get an IP version six address from a DHCP server. If and you know the DHCP server may or may not support it, but you can always try by asking. And if you're operating an internet an ISP, it, it, you want to give access to your customers. Uh, you want to give them IP version six access, then you have to operate a dual stack network because your customers are going to want to access both. Um, it would be nice. Your customers might like to access version six, and they might like to get a public address, multiple public addresses through version six, but they definitely want to get access to the version four internet because that's the majority of the internet. Okay, so so as an ISP, you would need to give your customers both um, version four and version six addresses. So if machines have multiple addresses, how does this work? Like, how do, how do we learn about those? Well, again, we use DNS. DNS has a special type of records called quad A records. Uh, remember, this, the a, traditional A records are the uh, host name to IP version 4 address mappings. There also are quad A records that provide IP version 6 addresses for host names. Okay, so if you're connecting to google.com and you are a dual stack client, you support both versions of IP, uh, you make a DNS request of two types, both an A request and a quad A request, to get both the version four and the version six addresses for that host. Um, you know, it could be that that Google.com does not support um, IP version six. I mean, it does, but let's say SteveTarzi.com, my, my website, does not support IP version six. So if you made a quad A request for that domain, you would not get a response. And so you could fall back to using version four instead. And the way you do that is. This is called the happy eyes uh, protocol for, for dual stack operation, but basically it involves, it's pretty simple. I mean, the client just makes two DNS requests at the same time. And uh, well, it doesn't really matter how they do it, but they, they, you expect they would do it in parallel. So you get back two IP addresses and um, you don't stop there. You don't automatically use version six just because version six is available. Uh, what you do is you, you create you try try them both in parallel and see which finishes first. So you 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 do the TCP handshake for the to the version six address and also to the version four address at the same time. Whichever one acknowledges uh, first, whichever one sends a synac back first, um, you acknowledge. And for the other one, you send a reset to close the connection. So in this case, version six responded faster. So this client is going to use version six. Uh, if you look at these details, this RST reset packet closes uh, a connection. So it's the client has decided to close the version 4 connection because uh, the response came back later than the version 6. Uh, so to summarize some of this interoperability, you know, version 6 to version 6 or 4 to 4 works normally. If you want to communicate from, from 6 to 6, you can also do that through an IP version 4 network using tunneling. But that, notice that the destination, the source and destination are the same. If you try to mix the source and destination protocol versions, it just is not going to work. It's not possible. So if you are IP version four and you want to talk to an IP version six machine, that is not possible. One of either you or the other person has to support both, so that you can choose the one one of the the one protocol that you both support. Okay. So that's why dual stack configurations are so popular uh, and necessary. Okay. Um, tunnel brokers are organizations that allow uh, customer, anyone to uh, create a tunnel to connect to the IP version 6 internet. So we, we talked before about uh, tunnel routers that were peers that made a, a, an agreement to send package back and packets back and forth, probably for mutual benefit. If you're a smaller organization and you st and you want to connect to the IP version six internet, you may not be able to establish a peering relationship, but you could pay a tunnel broker. Or there also is a, there's a free one that Hurricane Electric, which is a tier tier one ISP, they operate a tunnel. So if you're if you at home want to use IP version six and your ISP does not support it, you can still do it, 
by having your computer establish a tunnel to Hurricane Electric and uh, use IP version 6. That's which is kind of cool. Okay. All right, so to recap today, we talked about two topics, NAT and IP version 6. They're both kind of related to um, the shortage of IP addresses on IP version 4. With NAT, we have a concept of private networks that don't have public IP addresses. They're isolated from the public internet, but you have a single public IP address on the public internet that is shared by all those machines through a network address translator or NAT. Port mapping allows those multiple machines to appear like one big machine with multiple processes on that public IP address that the NAT is managing. A cool thing about this is that it, it doesn't require any awareness or cooperation of the translation by the hosts on either side, whether it's like your, your clients on the inside or just servers on the outside or whatever, however you want to describe them. Um, NAT can also be used by in a, in a flipped around way to implement a load balancer, and we call that a layer, layer 4 load balancer. NATs are an example of a middle box. Uh, other examples of middle boxes are firewalls and security appliances. A middle box is something that handles and manipulates packets, but it's not, it's not doing forwarding. In other words, it's not just a router. We talked about IP version 6, so that we get addresses that are four times longer, which is great because we have practically unlimited public addresses now with IP version 6. But the downside, the big downside, is that we have 20 bytes of additional header overhead. And that's slowed some people to adopt it. Also, it's not directly compatible with IP version 4. Right now, it's adopted by, let's say, about 30% of N hosts. Um, dual stack hosts have both IP version 4 and, and version 6 addresses, which allows them to reach the entire internet. And the adoption of IP version 6 has been enabled by tunneling that allows IP version 6 traffic to flow through IP version 4 links to travel through routers that just have no interest or have not decided yet to upgrade to IP version 6. Okay. All right, that does it for today. I hope that was uh, informative and see you next time. Next time we're going to be talking about routing algorithms to see how paths are, are defined on the internet.